Hello, I'm Charles Hubble, your host and narrator for our podcast series, Deceived, the Moo Years. Deceived, the Moo Years is the true story of one young man's compelling, at times terrifying, former involvement with the martial arts cult Chung Mu Kwan. Based on his soon-to-be-published memoir titled Deceived, A Journey Into Darkness, author-producer Russell Johnson's 12-week podcast combines a powerful narrative and witness interviews with martial artists, mind control experts, and former victims of the Chung Mu Kwan. The podcast will also be narrated in Korean, and Korean members of our production team will be available to add cultural insight as we consider each week who was John C. Kim. This podcast is not anti-martial arts. In fact, professional martial artists will discuss how to identify a good school from a bad one. The following story you are about to hear is true. It took place between 1980 and 1996. Most of the names have been changed. There are other versions of the story. My name is Russell Johnson, and this one is mine. Deceived, the Moo Years, Episode 3. One definition of the word deceived is of a person who causes someone to believe something that is not true, typically in order to gain some personal advantage. Within destructive cults, one common thread is deception and a hidden agenda. While in high school, Russell had a law class that taught about the unethical sale tactic known as bait and switch. They, or the Moo, used it on Russell, offering the black belt course, then switching down to special private lessons, causing him to pay even more money for lessons. For three years, Russell idolized Aidan Gonzalez, putting him up on a pedestal. Russell remembered the bait-and-switch lesson and could not help but feel that he had been lied to. As human beings, we tend to put people up on a pedestal. We idolize them. We come to expect the impossible of them, expecting more than is humanly possible. Over the years, we've all seen many examples of this. The beloved television evangelist who is caught committing a sin. The sports star caught using steroids. Sooner or later, they let us down and show their human flaws and foibles. In order to place another above us, we have to consider ourselves as beneath them. Such was the relationship between Russell and Aiden. Now Russell was starting to see Aiden as a bit more human. In July of 1983, Russell received a phone call from a former girlfriend, Tina Klein, whom he had known since he was 14. He had searched for her for five years, so he couldn't believe she'd come back to him. When I was 14 years old, I met this beautiful girl. It was at a time where both of us had survived traumatic events in our lives. I remember seeing her for the first time, and she saw me. There she was, the prettiest little girl, and she saw me. They talked on the phone for hours, catching up on the past five years. He told Tina about his martial arts training and the stories of the school of Chung Mu Kwan. That night, Russell brought Tina to the outside of the Chung Mu Kwan School C after it closed and kissed the girl that he would love for the rest of his life. It was around this time that Russell's training interest began to stall because Aiden had lied to him about being accepted into the black belt course. About two weeks after seeing Tina again, Russell asked her to marry him. She accepted. Tina became concerned that if given the choice, Russell would choose the school over her, but Aiden had lied to him, and now Tina was asking him to make a choice, so Russell chose her. What was about to happen to me with Tina is what the Moo called losing your mind over a woman. It's not uncommon when you are a member of a destructive cult to have a loved one, in this case Tina, ask you to make a choice, her or them. When a member of the Moo would leave the school for a woman, the instructors would say, Oh, that one? He lost his mind over a woman. Russell worked at Shamrock Industries, a plastics factory that made ice cream buckets, and it was a good-paying union job. He got Tina a job at Shamrock with hopes that they would be building a life together. Their relationship was rocky from the start. Both had too many mental and emotional scars, and working together 
strained the relationship until they broke it off. He never stopped loving her. I lost track of Tina over the years, but I never forgot about her. Like me, her life took many rough roads. It's hard to believe that we wouldn't have been better off staying together. We are friends again, and recently I officiated her daughter's wedding. Over the next year, Russell began to save money and buy the things that he never had. One of his first purchases was a king-size waterbed. For most of his life, he had an old folding bed with a protruding spring that scarred and cut him while he slept. His next purchase was a JVC stereo system that cost him $1,300. In the 1980s, that was a lot of money. He secured loans, made monthly payments, and even paid the loans off early. Russell traded in the old Toyota Corolla he'd bought from his older brother for $50 and purchased a beautiful 1982 Trans Am. It had 30,000 miles, painted pinstriping, and a crushed velvet interior. My brother sold me this beat-up Toyota for 50 bucks. That car was a lot of fun. It reminded me of a go-kart. I traded it in for the Trans Am. Living in the Minneapolis neighborhood of Mississippi Courts, Russell saw a lot of vandalism to cars. But he was well-liked, so the Trans Am remained unscathed. This was a good time in his life, with a good-paying job and friends. It was also time for Russell, 19, to leave home, and he moved in with a co-worker. At the same time, the things Russell saw and experienced in Chung Mu Kwan never left him, and he missed his training and Aiden. Russell was looking for a way to change his life. He met with a U.S. Air Force recruiter and started studying for the entrance exam. I was going through this time that I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. After breaking up with Tina, I started thinking about going back to the Moo, but I thought that I would never be accepted back. So before taking the Air Force entrance exam, I went out and I got drunk, and I wrote a letter to Aiden asking to be allowed to return to school. Two weeks passed before Russell received a call from Chung Mu Kwan instructor Matt Kemps, who Russell had never met. At the school, Matt was very stern, saying that Russell's departure without handing in his belt or giving notice and breaking his contract had been disrespectful. This was his last chance. He'd be put on a 90-day probation, and his third section belt would be held until that time. Russell was made to pay another lifetime membership fee and given a new student number, 1013. I had a hard time being given the new student number of 1013. By this time, Aiden had instilled within me that 4 and 13 were unlucky numbers. It was hard to believe that this number even existed in school. I had this weird feeling that it was a sign of things to come. It was an omen. He asked if he could have any other number, but Matt refused to change it. Russell worried this could be some kind of omen. Matt had a casual conversation with Russell, which included questions like, what kind of life Russell was making for himself? What was he doing for work? What kind of car did he drive? Did he live at home or by himself? Russell would later learn this technique was known to instructors as sideways conversation, Russell was unaware this conversation would be kept in a secret dossier to be used to manipulate him. Matt told him regional head instructor Aiden had moved back to California to be closer to his family and that he taught for the school there. It was much later that Russell learned the truth. Aiden left in the middle of the night with only the shirt on his back. At the time he wrote that letter to request reinstatement, Russell was unaware it would be used to manipulate him. Instructors would meet in groups, passing around the membership photos while discussing each individual student. The goal was to get them into higher-priced classes, and ultimately, the black belt course. This was called handling. A former instructor from Minnesota says his school kept dossiers on students with detailed personal information. We looked for people's weaknesses, we would spend time in groups going over each individual student uh, and determining how to best hit their mind, as it was put. They were trained to be intuitive because there was a way to handle every type of person. It didn't matter who they were or what position they held in life, doctor, lawyer, businessman. 
the school would build a profile with detailed personal information. Most disturbing of all, instructors believed they were doing this for the person's own good. Later, when Matt taught Russell how to run a school and handle a student, Russell realized how skillfully Matt had handled him. Russell's letter gave Matt everything he needed to handle him. Matt would exploit Russell's guilt for the way he had left and his fear that he would not be allowed to return. Looking back, I could see that Matt had played me. He used that letter and my guilt about how I left the school to instill fear that I might not be able to return, to manipulate me. As Russell returned to Chung Mu Kwan training, he noticed a number of changes. When Russell left, Aiden had about 11 assistant instructors that trained under him, but only three of them still trained at the school. Russell was told that those assistant instructors who trained under Aiden quit after Aiden moved to California. The three remaining instructors were Keith Brown, Dan Matthews, and Andy Quaid. Keith was a painter by trade. Dan was a cook. Andy was a printer. There was also another instructor whom Russell had never met, Mason Holmes. And together with Matt, they ran the school. Russell noticed differences in training during practice time. As he went through movements that Aiden had taught him, he would see puzzled looks on both Matt and Mason. They would ask Russell who taught him the movement. He would reply regional head instructor Aiden. They would give him this weird look, almost as if they had never seen the movement before, then say it was advanced for his level of training. Matt and Mason were both third-degree black belt at the time, but Russell did not see in them the same level of skill that he had witnessed in Aiden. He wondered if they were holding back for some reason. He watched them demonstrate forms. The grace and power Aiden exhibited was not there. While training under Aiden, students sparred once a week. But now, sparring almost never happened. When it did, because it was considered incorrect to actually hit your higher belt, it was just going through the motions. By all accounts, Matt and Mason were decent family men. Like all Chung Mu Kwan instructors, they started as students, sacrificing time with family and loved ones. They became mentally and financially bound to the Chung Mu Kwan training. Instructors had faith in Master Kim's promise of a better tomorrow, the promise that in return for their sacrifices, they and their families would be set physically and financially in the future. Their story is one of hope and disillusion, trust and betrayal. Looking back, they say they were exploited by a cult and that they unwittingly helped exploit others. They're speaking out despite fear of retaliation so that others don't fall into the same trap. They started as students and advanced to instructors, but getting there was expensive. This former instructor says he spent $50,000 on lessons, shared an apartment with other instructors, and worked 18 hours a day for no pay. Like the students that trained under them, they too believed in Master Kim's supernatural powers and that Chung Mu Kwan schools existed in Asia. It's easier to be sold a lie when the person selling it believes that it's true. Mason managed the school during the day and then went to his night job as a cook, which is when Matt took over. Instructors met at night for training at School A on Lake Street. There were three other regional head instructors in Minnesota. Fred Cruella, of Polish descent, trained under John C. Kim in the Chicago area. He was the highest rank instructor under Master Kim. Russell met Fred a couple of times before while Aiden was away from School C. Russell never saw Fred move before, but judging by the ragged condition of his black belt worn from years of training and the fact that he was the highest ranked Chung Mu Kwan black belt, Russell assumed that he was highly skilled. A scary guy, Fred also seemed a little nuts. Russell thought if a movie was made about Chung Mu Kwan, Christopher Walken should play Fred. It was rumored that he went crazy one day and started beating his car with a baseball bat. Russell didn't know if the story was true, but he knew that he never wanted to cross Fred. One day, while Fred was teaching, a student tried to explain that he had a back problem 
and was unable to do the movements. Fred ran up behind this student sitting on the floor, kicked him hard in the back, and said, You do not talk during exercise. This happened while I was training under Aiden, and he was out sick. The student was sitting on the floor with his knees crossed, his arms up in the air, doing deeper breathing exercises. Fred ran up to him, kicking him hard in the back. It scared me, and I stayed away from classes for a couple days, until Aiden returned. Now that Aiden was gone, Russell saw more of Fred, but he never saw Fred demonstrate movements or move around. Mostly, Russell saw Fred's cruelty toward instructors, especially those who had trained under Aiden. It was almost like they were being punished. Fred was particularly hard on Keith Brown, reprimanding him constantly for one thing or another. Always, Keith had to do Chung Mu Kwan push-ups. One winter morning, Russell found Keith outside the school entrance, doing push-ups and blocking the door. As Russell waited to walk inside, Fred ordered Russell to step over Keith. Stepping over Keith was a sign of disrespect, but Russell was being ordered to do so by Fred and knew better than to disobey his command. I remember that day. Keith was on the sidewalk blocking the doorway into the school as Fred stood over him, yelling at him as he did push-ups. It was a cold Minnesota winter day. Aiden's students had admired and respected him, but Fred would command respect through fear and intimidation and physical acts of violence. Like most cults, fear would be used to control Mu students. Former students and instructors say violence was used to keep them in line as well. They would beat you up physically, you know, if you didn't do whatever they wanted you to do, whether it's sign a contract or open a door or hand things with two hands or forget to bow, they would physically hurt you. A few times after Keith had done the push-ups, Russell noticed Keith's arms had become so swollen that he was unable to bend them. Most of the time, Keith was exhausted from lack of sleep. Russell was told that sleep deprivation helped build a stronger mind and concentration. Jared Jacobson was the second highest ranking instructor in Minnesota and held the rank of fifth degree black belt regional head instructor. Jared was a Filipino that trained in Chung Mu Kwan in California before leaving his family to help open schools in Minnesota and teach classes. The longer an instructor was in school, the more intense the facial expressions would be. They would actually practice these looks in the mirror. Sometimes, higher belts could stare at you, and these intimidating looks would be frightening. They would use this to their advantage. I remember this instructor sitting behind the desk in the office, and he talked about how he had practiced the stare in the mirror. He demonstrated it by covering up his face. He would look at me happy, he would cover up his face again, and then he would look intimidating. To be called into the office while Jared was in the school was usually not a good thing. He could verbally tear you apart, making you feel like a weak-minded person who needed more Chung Mu Kwan training. Watching Jared move around was not the same as watching Aiden. You could see the years of dedication to his training, but Jared was not as smooth as Aiden. Jared liked to play, finding things to strike students with. Sometimes it was a rolled-up newspaper, sometimes a weapon. They would act like it was fun, but you definitely did not want to be on the receiving end. Jared would come into School C a few times a month, and you never knew what to expect. We would run around the practice area while Jared hit us with a rolled-up newspaper. We ran around like little kids, acting like it was fun being hit. Once... One of Russell's higher belts, a second-degree instructor who had also trained with Aiden, was being mentally corrected by Jared. He was told to face the corner of the practice area. The instructor broke down and started crying. It appeared to Russell that the instructor had been mentally broken. Russell vowed to himself that they would never break him. I remember seeing my friend break. He was in tears facing the corner of the practice area, crying in front of all his lower belts. I could not imagine what he could have done to be humiliated this way. I was suddenly angered and confused by what I had witnessed. He was starting to see many questionable things, but told himself that if this was where Aiden had been trained, then he would go through it too. 
Jordan Bain was the third highest ranking instructor in Minnesota, just under Jarrett. Jordan was a black man who started his training when he was 16. Jordan's skill level was the closest to Aiden's. Watching him move around was impressive. Everything about Jordan was smooth and clean, graceful and powerful. Russell didn't remember ever being mentally corrected by Jordan. Jordan was always polite, his voice calm, and he usually had a smile on his face. I think that if it were not for Jordan, I might have left for good sooner than I did. He gave me the hope that Chumaquan was real. Russell worked the 3 to 11 p.m. shift at Shamrock Industries, training at School C usually from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Just before work, Matt Holmes taught the morning class and oversaw most of Russell's training. The students and instructors in school spoke in a weird, controlled, pidgin English language. It's been said that if you can control the way a person speaks, you can control the way they think. In terms of mind control, this is called loaded language. The Mu had many terms for describing people. Missing meant that there was a mental deficiency. Clear meant that the member had reached a state of enlightenment usually referring to a higher belt, or a desired goal of achieving, or are you clear on the direction they are giving you? Bangu equals shit. Dochi mind meant drunken mind. The school had terms to describe non-members, outsiders, jealous ones, inferior. Some of the terms would be thought-stopping. If you are asked, where's your mind, you were about to be told. The instructor was about to give a mental correction on the mistake you had made. To be asked, would you do that way toward master? The student would reply, no. The instructor would continue. You would be told if you do that way towards master in Asia, you die. Everything that we did was compared to the non-existent Mu schools in Asia. And the punishment for doing something wrong towards John C. Kim in Asia was death. This instructor says that when he quit, a supervisor threatened to have him killed. To this day, you're still scared of them? Yes. Why? I don't want them to be killed. There's a lot of people listening to every word that the higher belts say, and they'd do anything, even kill somebody, if they were told to kill somebody. Do you really think that? Sure. You're not exaggerating. Oh, no. Most of the time, a conversation between a lower belt to a higher belt started out with the phrase, be all right to ask, or be all right to say. In the morning, Russell would come to the school and bow to the American and Korean flags, then bow again to the instructor seated behind the desk. Next would be to ask the instructor, be all right to ask if there is anything I can do for school? Chung Mu Kwan always referred to it as school, never as the school. School always came first. Whenever the school needed anything, from mirrors to coffee, the instructor would ask a student, do you have change? Change meant cash within the school. If the student did have change, then he would be expected to purchase the item and give the instructor the receipt. The second question the student would ask is, be all right to ask if yourself care for anything? Meaning, can the student go and get you coffee, something to eat, etc.? Again, you would be asked if you had change. By calling money change, it diminished its value. Mason would normally tell Russell to go to the coffee shop next door and get a rainbow sprinkled donut and a cup of coffee. Russell always tried to have enough money on him to cover that coffee and donut. Upon returning to his training, Russell had to hand in his third section belt for the duration of his 90-day probation. Due to his training under Aiden, Russell was more advanced than many of the students at that time. Within six weeks of returning, his belt was returned to him. Chung Mu Kwan had advertising flyers with pictures of John C. Kim. And while training under Aiden, Russell would go out and pass them out door to door, taping them on windows of commercial buildings. Before leaving the school for work, he would step back to the office door and ask again, be all right to ask if there is anything I can do for school? Be all right to ask if yourself care for anything? Then ask, 
be all right to change and go to work? If he was not working, he'd ask if he could pass out flyers for the school. Mason was impressed that Russell would ask to do this at his level. They called it a flyer, but it was really the size of a poster. It was big. Not everyone was happy when you asked if you could hang up a flyer and you hang up a big-ass poster instead. There was another student in the school, Ken, who was the same level as Russell. Ken also had a Trans Am and they'd hang out together, cruising around town. Most of the school instructors did not drive very nice cars, and it was considered a luxury to have one. Ken and Russell both felt that their Trans Ams were frowned upon. Aiden had driven an old red station wagon that he shared with two other instructors. They were told that Master John C. Kim trained for 50 years to learn the knowledge of Chung Mu Kwan, and there was a price for being able to learn that knowledge. No matter what personal sacrifices were made, they could never compare to that of Master Kim. Next week on Deceive the Mooyers, Episode 3 Plus 1, Fears, Phobias, Superstitions, and Unlucky Numbers. Deceive the Mooyers is a production of Deja Moo, LLC. Recorded and produced by Alive and Social Podcast Network. Russell Johnson, producer and writer. Charles Hubble, host and narrator, David Bruskin, editor, Russ Meyer, co-writer and editor, Aaron Tro, sound producer, Brian Price, audio editor, Wyatt Sarber, sound engineering, Woon Tae Ryu is our advisor in South Korea, Authentic is our advertising representative, Deceive the Mooyers is represented by Young Entertainment Law.